<laughs> I've been in a, I've been in, <laughs> been in a rare place all day today. You know, Christians, I know some very, very, very sad, sad Christians. They walk around defeated on the earth, and you know, we all have problems, and I, it just breaks my heart because of what God given us. We ought not be like other people. We're not in the world. We're in it, but not of it. And, and I mean, just think of the precious blood, the total erasing of yesterday. It's gone from God's mind what we did yesterday. He doesn't remember. We remember, but he doesn't. The, the Holy Spirit and the gifts and the, and the fruits of the spirit all those things that god's given us in his wonderful son and his word we ought to be the most happiest people in the world it doesn't matter what's going out on in the world with government you know jesus says do what i did father forgive them they don't know what they're doing the whole world is falling apart but we have a future and a hope that's just a few days away and we're going to be in the kingdom with him we ought to really Rock the world for Jesus. Don't be like other people. It's, we've got, we haven't got time, folks. It's, the time is short. And tonight I want to talk about double-minded double minded saints or born-again sinners. <laughs> Take your pick. Double-minded saints or born-again sinners. I guess you could call it either one, but... Our text is in James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And let me read it to you out of the Amplified. This uh, verse has always bothered me because I knew when I was young in the Lord that I loved him and that I believed his word. However, when it came to applying the actual word in my life and walking it out, I always fell short. The reason was because I was trying to do it without God's grace, and none of us can do anything without God's grace. So I, would, I could relate to this verse. It's about the double-minded man. He says, in, starting in verse 5, James 1, If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of, of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault-finding, and it will be given him. In other words, James is telling us it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what shape you're in. You can be backslidden. You can be in full-fledged sin. But if you seek God, he's not going to hold it against you. If you come to him in faith and believing, God will give you wisdom if you believe. It doesn't matter what shape any of us are in. That's a wonderful promise. Oh, only it must be in faith and <clears throat> that he ask with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting, for the one who wavers is like the billowing surge out at sea that is blown, blown hither, thither, and tossed like the wind. For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything that he asks from the Lord. For being as he is, a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, resolute, that is, he is unstable, and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels, and decides. Have you ever been in a place where you question a decision that you made? Have you ever thought, is God going to answer me this time? Is he going to hear me this time? That's a dubious, double-minded. That's a carnal Christian or a <clears throat> born-again saint. <laughs> Okay, we all do it. I'm not preaching anything. I'm not guilty of myself. Because I would, I, like when I, I would, it's like Paul. He did the things that he didn't want to do. And he didn't do the things that he wanted to do. He was striving after God. And he was comparing that to when the law comes in. But in his flesh, he would try to do good, but he couldn't do good. And when he would try to stifle, like, habits or addictions or anything I mean we have all got some something somewhere that sometimes has control of us for some of us it's anger for some of us it's spending for some of us it could be our family I mean we all have areas that we're double-minded in and we're God <laughs> and where God needs to have power and we need to give him the driver's seat so 
eventually wavering in an area of our lives is going to cost us something and it could be too great a cost for us to consider so decisions made with emotions keep us double-minded and in the carnal realm of adolescent spirituality there's no one no, no more miserable than a born-again sinner would you agree with that our emotions we're, we're creatures of emotion and we're driven from the time we're babies where our parents give in to us if we cry or if we scream or if we yell we're taught to be carnal little beings from the day we're born and the Spirit of God comes in and says no longer I'm gonna rule I want you to let me rule in you let me renew your soul and renew your mind start thinking from the inside out instead of from the outside in most of us think from the outside in what we seal feel taste hear that's what we do we, we we're too much we live too much in the world and too much in the carnal realm so what are we to do to be steadfast believers so that we can mature in our walk with the Lord? Well, let's begin first looking at some of the areas that we waver in. One area that I wavered in for years was tithing and giving, you know, and be in church on Sunday and I surrender all and these beautiful songs would be playing and I go, God, oh yes, God, I'm gonna be a tither and be a giver until things got short. You know, I mean, it was a commitment, but it wasn't really a commitment. If you're going to be a tither or a giver, you're going to have to give and tithe all the time, no matter how little or how much you have. That's as simple as it is. And all it is is a decision. It has nothing to do with emotion. You don't have to be flaky in your giving. If you have a dime, give a penny. If you have a dollar, give a dime. If you've got $100,000, give $10,000. It all comes out to be the same no matter how much or how little you have. Well, I learned not to be flaky in my giving because when I gave, God always took care of me somehow. When I didn't give, things really got tight. <laughs> <laughs> so I was flaky in my giving. Now, I'm not flaky in my giving anymore. <clears throat> the other area was my commitments with other people. You know, I'd make a, I'd, uh, somebody would say, can you go pick up sister so-and-so <clears throat> on, on your way to church Sunday? And I'd say, oh, sure, I'll be happy to pick her up. And then Sunday morning came, and I don't feel like going to church, you know? or something like that. So sister so-and-so was out in the cold because I was a flaky, double-minded, carnal, born-again sinner Christian because <laughs> I couldn't make up my mind. So we've got to mature in God and we've got to stand by our word. We've got to understand that our word and our commitment are God's character in us. And when we commit to something and say we're going to do something, we need to follow through. What's happened to honor in this nation? What's happened to trust in this nation? As Christians, we ought to be the most honorable and trustworthy people in the world. And me, every, the world ought to know that when you say something, it's going to happen. You're going to stick with it. When you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. So we can backslide in our giving, in our commitments. We can backslide in our love walk. Oh boy, this is a big, <laughs> Pastor Tom preaches on love all the time. I know I've, I've experienced every one of these. We, it, in our love walk with others, we might have a dear friend who has one little tiny weak moment and says something mean to us and really hurts our feelings. And that's it. I'm through. I'm not talking to her anymore. She's two-faced. How could she do that to me? And on and on and on. And now we're no longer friends. How many have been hurt by somebody really close to you? Said terrible things to you. And you get all huffy and ooh, puffy. That's not the love walk. The love walk is to love those that hate you, spitefully use you, and persecute you. Jesus says to pray for them and love them. You can overlook that if you're walking in this new kind of love that Pastor Tom's always talking about. In the flesh, it'll never happen. You're going to always have hurt feelings. You're going to always feel betrayed. And you're going to always feel some type of personal injury. But folks, you know what? It ain't about you. It's not about me. 
It's about him. He's the only thing that matters in life. And what we do for others and in front of others speaks greatly and highly of the Lord Jesus. That's why we've got to dig deeper with our commitments and our love walk. Let's say your husband or your wife or children disappoint us in some way. We still love them unconditionally because they're our family. But this, do we think of something either to withhold or annoy them with? <laughs> do you ever think of maybe <clears throat> getting even, even though you love them unconditionally? That I've, I've done that. I was terrible in my <laughs> early years. I used to let make Mark miserable. Man, he, he, he would never argue with me. I would be livid and just banging and wanting to fight a good, good fight. And he'd go to bed and go to sleep. Oh, my God, that made me so mad. I couldn't stand the fact that I, what I was going through didn't bother him one bit. So I'd be... I'd, I, would, I wouldn't talk to him for days on end. And you know what? He never even cared. He acted like I wasn't even there. It didn't even bother him. So let me tell you, when you have a spouse who reacts like that, that's no reaction, you get over yourself pretty quick. Because I found out that that didn't work with him. I had to actually sit down and talk to him. Wow. That was a novel approach, talking to your spouse. But I did. I used to not talk to him or not make him dinner, which he probably was glad about that. <laughs> Do getting even with him. How about, how about backsliding in our relationship with God? We're awful and often double-minded about what we think God will do for us. You know, how many of you, if a friend came to you and needed prayer, and you prayed for them, and you knew God would hear that prayer and answer it for them? You knew he will. I know for others that God will always answer their prayers, but when it comes to us, do we really think God's going to answer our prayer? Or are we too focused on maybe we weren't holy enough yesterday? Maybe I didn't pray long enough, or maybe I didn't read the word long enough. Maybe God will answer the prayer, and maybe he won't. Well, let me ask you, is God's grace based on your performance? No. It's based on his love. He'll answer your prayer. We need to think more highly of ourselves, too. We need to understand that we're valuable to God, and he hears our prayers, not just our friends and our family. So what are we, what are we doing at that point in time? We're doubting God. We're not taking God at his word because we know he'll do for our friends what he wouldn't do for us. We're double-minded about ourselves because we believe if we haven't again done just perfect, God won't bless us. But yet you wouldn't think that of another person. God is no respecter of persons, and it's not based on what you or I do or what you and I say or what you and I think. It's not based on spending four hours a day in the Word and 30 minutes a day in prayer and praising God and singing in the choir and going to church three, four, five, six, seven times a week. We don't do those things to get God's love. We do those things because we love God. God doesn't base his love on what we do. He said a long time ago, this, he told Moses, this is what I'm going to do for you. He told Abraham, this is what I will do for you. And Abraham came into agreement with God. God sending his son saying, this is what I've done for you. I've not only given you eternal life in heaven, but you have eternal life right here on earth, right now, right within you. And I'm going to do it because I'm committed to you, not because you're committed to me. It's not based on anything we do. It's totally based on God. So let's quit being double-minded about God's love for us. Let's reach down a little deeper. <clears throat> Oh, like this one. We all know that the devil has no new tools. Well, one of his good tools is getting people double-minded, getting their eyes off God and on self, having us backslide in areas where God's helping us to make progress. Elijah asked the children of Israel how long they would halt and limp between two opinions. Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow Baal? Make up your mind. You're halting and limping when you're double-minded. You're not walking in the kingdom. Joshua in Joshua 24, 15 said, 
Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord God. So it's our choice, but it's his promise. So let's not halt and limp between what God is and what's what we are, because it's not based on what we are. Remember Balaam the prophet, Balak, the king of Midian? The children of Israel were going into the promised land, and Balak came to Balaam, who was a prophet, and said, well, will you please curse these people for me? So Balaam went to God and asked God, he goes, can I curse these people? And God said, no, no what I blessed shall no man curse. Well, Balak kept offering him more and more riches and money and title and all this stuff. So Balaam started to have his flesh tickled, and he went back to God four times, and finally God wouldn't, God wouldn't even speak with him anymore because God is not going to curse what God has blessed. So Balaam was double-minded in that he wanted the riches from the Midian kingdom, but he also wanted to be with God. You can't have it both ways. It's got to be one or the other. The original Hebrew word for stable that James references means to dwell, remain, abide, confirm, and stand firm. By standing firm, we fulfill the law of liberty in Christ. What does this mean? That James, James tells us if we don't do what the word says, we're like a man looking into a mirror, he looks at his reflection, but as soon as he walks away, he forgets what he sees. You know, <laughs> that's like me looking in the mirror in the morning, getting my hair all done and all gussied up and going away to work and thinking that I look really good and having a big piece of broccoli stuck in my teeth or on my nose because I didn't see it when I looked in the mirror. That's the double man in my, in James, the guy doesn't have a real vision of who he is. And he doesn't understand God's laws. It's not based on us. It's based on God's promises. That will keep us more focused on him and less focused on ourselves and a lot less double-minded if we'll just believe what the word says. Now, Jesus, I'm going to, you know, you know the parable of the sower and Jesus is telling his <clears throat> disciples in Matthew 13, he said, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the roadside, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they had not much soil, and at once they sprang up because they had no depth. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they dried up and withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. And his disciples said, can you explain to us the parable of the sower? And he said, the son of God is the sower and the word is the seed. And he was talking about how people, different people in this life will receive the kingdom. And when he explained it to them, he said, while anyone is hearing the word of the kingdom and does not grasp and comprehend it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the roadside. And for what was sown on the thin rocky soil, this is the man who hears the word and at once welcomes it and accepts it with joy. Yet he has no real root in himself, but is temporary. And when affliction or trouble or persecution comes on account of the word, at once he is caused to stumble and he falls away. And for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of this world, the pleasure and delight and glamour, and the deceitfulness, deceitfulness of riches choke and suffocate the word, and it yields no fruit. And for what was sown on go good soil, this is he who hears the word and grasps and comprehends it. He indeed bears fruit and yields it, in one case a hundred times as much, as was sown in another 60 times as much and in another 30 times. I want to be that seed. I want God's word to be in my heart. I want to have root and depth in me. I don't want the cares of this world and the deceitfulness and lust for money and fame and entertainment and all that stuff. I don't want that to choke, 
the word out in me because I got nothing but God. I mean, my life was, I was worthless. I was a piece of dirt on this earth, and I was headed for hell. And I'm telling you, I don't want to be that person again. I'll do whatever it takes to please my Lord because of what he's done for me. He's just been so wonderful to me. I can't, even during times of trial, he's with me. I can feel his presence constantly. I know he's with me, and I know he loves me. I want to be the fruitful, non-double-minded, carnal, Christian, born-again sinner. I don't want to be that person. I want to be God's child all the time, and I want stability. But the thing is, how do you get that stability? Well, good question. What does Pastor Tom teach about all the time? What does Pastor Tom teach about? What? Thank you. <laughs> okay. The conclusion is these three remain, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of which is love. If we have a faith walk where we can lay our hands on the deaf and the here and the cancers, are healed and the dead are raised. We can have the most magnificent mountain moving faith ministry in the world. But you know what Paul says? If you haven't got love, it ain't worth a flip. There's no power in it because faith works through love. <laughs> Without love, it's all show and it's not lasting. Our love walk is the most important thing because if we love people we're not going to be flaky we're not going to get mad at them or if we do we're not going to say anything to cause them hurt we're not going to renege on our commitments with god as far as our giving or our word or our appointments with other love fulfills all those things so a double-minded saint is someone who's very immature and very young in the lord and they have a you know i mean we've all been there and they have a lot of growing to do but if you can study one thing in this life, get tapes, come to these services, get Tom's books, read it, read it, read it. Master on love, because when you walk in that wonderful love, nobody can touch you. <laughs> love, love, there, nothing is stronger than love. It protects us. It keeps us at peace. And it helps us maintain our commitments and our love for others. And believe me, there's a lot of people around me who I don't like very well, but I've learned to love them. Not talking about my family. They're always annoying. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but you love them anyway because you have to. <laughs> You're stuck with them. <laughs> you can't get away from them either. They're always going to be there. <laughs> no, I love my family. I'm very grateful to God for my kids and grandkids. But there's a really bunch of annoying people at work, and I just like to take them out behind the horse barn and just whoop them. You know what I mean? And, and there's a lot of people I just don't like. But you know what? It doesn't mean I can't love them. I'm polite to them. I treat them with honor and respect. I don't gossip about them. I don't, I mean, there's just not any individual there that when I'm not with them one-on-one -on -one, that I just don't really want to love them and minister to them. But they're still annoying. <laughs> so I'm growing a little bit. I'm learning to love the unlovely. <laughs> figure God loved me I was the unloveliest of all okay so let's get down to this first John 4 says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from God everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God if you're not walking in love do you really know God whoever does not love does not know God because God is love this is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his dear son. Since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides. God abides. He makes his home in us when we have that love for each other, that unconditional love. I want God to abide. Do you want God to abide in you? Walk in love. So what is love? Well, basically, love is how you treat people. That's what it comes down to. It's really that simple. It's how you treat people. So if we're committed to walk in love, we will not 
withdraw on our commitments. We will treat others who do not treat us well with love, and we will pray for those who, again, spitefully use and abuse us. And if we're seeking that powerful, faith-filled life, it can only be done through God's agape love. Again, it's not how we feel, how much we've been hurt, what we want or don't want, what we have or don't have. It is not reality. It's higher than reality. It's truth. See, we live down here in fact. God lives up here in truth. We need to come up here where his truth defies the facts. Every time God's word will defy the facts if we'll just walk with him and fellowship with him every day. So all it is is making up our minds to follow God with our whole hearts, with all our strength and all our mind, and with every fiber in our being. And then those commitments and that double-minded nonsense and those silly carnal feelings of hurt and doubt and disbelief will all disappear because God will be growing in us and we'll be growing in him. Thank you. Amen. That's right. You know, uh, it's it's become a cliche, but it says, and uh, people say, uh, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, and uh, if you don't love them, they, you know, they don't they won't receive what you got to say. You know, love, love is what uh, love is a door opener. It really is. It really is. A person will open their heart up to receive what you have to say when they know you love them. Even if you ain't perfect, you know. So what she said tonight is so true. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Who got something out of that tonight? I did. Praise God. Well, um, if you're watching by internet tonight, um, the Ministry of Sunday International brings these uh, streamings uh, of these services live to you uh, free of charge to the church and uh, is a blessing to us, uh, provides this equipment and has been a blessing to our ministry, uh, has enabled us to broadcast to you. And we just, we thank God for the ministry of Sunday International. Um, and uh, it was, began a number of years ago uh, by the Christmans and that's, Kathy is one of the Christmans. <laughs> and and they do uh, other things too, uh, outreaches in the community here and, and around the world, several things going on as well. And um, I've got, go, got something going on all the time. And um, it's good soil. And this church sows into, into that soil regularly. And we thank God for them and um, thank God for their ministry. Amen. Well, um, and, and if you want to visit their website, let's see, if you want to pull that up, is there, let's see, the other one, the first one that uh, talks about Sunday. Can you pull that up? There you go. There's, there's their websites. I think that's updated. Is that updated? That's, that's updated right there, yeah. And so um, you can visit their websites at those websites listed on the screen there. Praise the Lord. I want you, everyone in, in this place, just to bow your heads and hearts with me. And I, I just want those that are watching by internet and those that are here tonight, uh, if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity right now to, to ask Jesus to come into your heart and to, to be the Lord and master of your life. To, you say, man, I've made a mess of things and I need Jesus in me and in my life and in my family's life and I, I need to start with me. Lord, change things in my life and let it start in me, inside me. If that's what you're thinking and, and feeling and knowing in your heart tonight, then you can pray this prayer with us. Uh, and if that's you in this place, just lift a hand to acknowledge that. If you need to pray a prayer to receive Jesus tonight, uh, either for the first time or for the umpteenth time, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're watching by internet and you want to pray this prayer, you can lift a hand right where you are and God sees you even though we can't. You can, you can though, after you pray this prayer, send us a note by, by hitting that prayer button and letting us know what you did, that you said that prayer with, with us. Um, but uh, 
everyone stand to your feet and let's just pray this prayer for the benefit of maybe someone watching uh, around the world somewhere. We have them watching in all different countries. So we thank God for, and in this country, we thank God for uh, all of our viewers. Hallelujah. Well, pray this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the cross. You paid the price for me so that I could be forgiven, washed clean, once and for all, free from sin. Thank you for washing me in your blood, delivering me, setting me free, making me new in you. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Lord, help me to serve you all of my days. Give me the strength to obey you and walk in your plans for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's right. Well, if you need prayer tonight, Kathy, if you want to come up.